all over the planet Earth. And so we want to uh, definitely make that known that um, that's who we are. And the APRP is a revolutionary, independent, mass Pan-African political party based in Africa. And our objective is Pan-Africanism, which we define correctly as one unified socialist Africa. And our work to achieve Pan-Africanism, you can find our strategy in Kwame Nkrumah's Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. It explains exactly the work the APRP is doing. So if you have not analytically studied uh, that work, then you don't understand our work. So be quiet, because you don't understand our work. And our Ancestors Voices is hosted each week by APRP organizers, myself, Ajamu, and my biological and ideological comrade daughter, Shakura. So to get us started, I'll turn it over to Shakura. Thank you, appreciate you, comrade. So apologies, family. Uh, we all know that capitalism works overtime to harden our work, to make things more impossible for us to do this work. And so um, today I am the one having internet issues. And so we thought it would be best to have the video off and hopefully you all are still able to hear me okay um, as we continue to talk about this important topic and you know, just speaking to our resilience, speaking to our inabilities to be stopped, right? Like I'm definitely sure that you know the criminals in action have something to do with this internet challenge that I've been facing for quite some time now. But the work must continue, and I think that you know, just as Comrade Ajamu was reflecting on the interactions they had with our comrade Sicily. I too have been thinking a lot about this comrade and, you know, as much as it breaks my heart to think about them not being on this physical earth with us anymore, uh, their legacy reigns true. I mean, they made it very clear that they were down for the people by any means necessary. And so um, comrade Ajamu, if it's okay with you, I think we can dedicate today's seminar to Cicely um, because the work must continue. Cicely would want that. And if Cicely were still living, they would continue to be organizing in all the organizations that they were a part of. And so with that, what a perfect topic for us to talk about. Um, I, I remember having these conversations with Cicely when I was a part of the Anti-Patriarchal Task Force. And um, we always talked about ways that we would try to address Africans who were struggling with this notion of, you know, how do they respond when other people question, you know, why they're still here if Africa is so great, why are you still here? You know, if your life is so much worse here, why haven't you left already? And so, you know, we will continue to talk through that as this hour progresses. But I think it's important to first acknowledge that these two phrases we see on the slide, so home is where the heart is, but also home sweet home, right? These are common. We've used these throughout our social existence as individuals, right? And so even though these terms are common, these phrases, I should say, are common. They are not really concrete. There's there's more to be said about it. And there's definitely more of a critical approach that we can take with really breaking down how we think about these things. And so, you know, just understanding that we as individuals, we we have the ability to adapt. That's that's how we've come to understand society. That's how we've come to survive in many situations. And that's how we will continue to apply our existence over time is feeling like we need to adapt, understanding the importance of being adaptable, right? And so we understand that that's how we can best deal with the environments that we find ourselves in is by adapting. And what we mean when we say that you all is that, you know, if you are feeling like you don't have a connection to Africa and you are in fact African, and if I may, we just want to be clear about how we define even the term African. So our comrade Kwame Nkrumah said it best, quote, I am not African because I was born in Africa, but because Africa was born in me. And so clearly that's the context that we're phrasing this in. And so if you find yourself identifying as Africa, because like Nkrumah, you too feel that Africa was born in you, then we have a better understanding of knowing that that's why 
we need to be able to stand for what we believe in and embrace the Africa that was born in us, embrace the cultural ways, the cultural terms, phrases, feelings, how we express ourselves, being unapologetic about that. Instead of adapting to a society where we feel like we have to change who we are, instead of feeling like we have to identify within a certain way, looking a certain way, smelling a certain way, having a certain type of attitude so that we are not coming off as too angry or too African or whatever the crazy rhetoric is today, making sure that we're not too loud. These are all ways that we have lost sight of Africa being an us. I don't know if you all have had a chance to go home to the motherland, but I am extremely privileged when I tell you that I have. And I felt so comfortable getting off that plane twice in my life where I knew that I could literally be myself and no one would question my decisions. No one would question why I behaved the way I did. As a four-year-old, it was a little bit harder for me to take that in, but I definitely felt connected. I definitely felt like people had my back and I felt like I was in the most happiest place that I can be in. Whereas as a 16 year old, I had a much better comfort feeling that was developed because I had more of an analysis. Now, yes, I still had a lot of growing to do even at 16, but the point I'm making to you all is I would walk down the street with my family or some of the comrades that we were with and I would hear people busting up laughing across the street in Senegal. I would hear people literally hollering at the top of their lungs because something was so funny. And maybe I did or did not understand the French dialogue that was taking place with some comrades, but I knew just based off of the tone, just based off of facial expressions, based off of hand gestures and hand movements, that some people were playing the dozens. Some people were clowning one another. Some people were making other people feel in a joking manner because that's who we are as a people. We also have such a collectivism about us that it is unreal how beautiful and how resilient we are with how much we welcome people and allow people to come and engage with the work that we're doing, engage with the events that we're having, engage in the parts of our lives that we have. I'm thankful that my parents were able to record my time in Ghana when I was four, because of course I don't remember that much, but seeing the footage, I think I've convinced myself that I do remember it, right? So we don't, we don't have time to go into the psychology of that, but I do appreciate being able to see the footage. And one example of how we are such a collectivist open people is we were invited to come to a baby shower. We didn't even know the people that were celebrating the fact that they were going to expand their family, but it was automatic that we were welcomed and we got to participate in the traditional procedures and rituals that take place during a baby shower. Not to mention the overall concept of acknowledging elders in the room before you proceed forward. And so these are the kind of things that we need to tap back into you all. We don't need to be adaptable because we need to try to change who we are or adjust who we are. We need to tap back into the things that we have lost sight of. We need to tap back in so that we understand that simply saying that home is where the heart is, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. We need to be able to look past that and understand that home isn't where the heart is. Home is so much more objectable and so much more objectified when we think about history or her story or their story, when we think about backgrounds, timelines, decisions that ancestors made, deciding whether or not they were going to take a stand for something because they knew that there was something bigger than themselves. Understanding our culture, as I just pointed out by quoting Nkrumah, and understanding that we have Africa in us. Africa has always been in us. The question, comrades, is whether or not we are suppressing it. The question is whether or not we are embracing it. The question is whether or not we are welcoming it to exist or are we making it feel uncomfortable like it needs to leave us. And I would be remorsed if I didn't also mention the social conditions that we find ourselves in because clearly those have everything to do with how we start to establish 
what we feel we can call home based on how we feel safe, based on if we feel like we can trust people, based on if we feel like we matter, whether or not we're being criminalized in the place that we're in, whether or not we feel like we are being treated with decency and humanity. Those are social conditions that have a clear direct impact on whether or not we get to call a place home based on understanding that just because you were born there, as Nkrumah pointed out, that doesn't mean that that is how you must identify. And understanding the propaganda that the US imperialist America has pushed down our throats is gonna be so important, so significant, and so crucial as we continue to think about this concept because the objective is for them to continue to make us feel like we need to just accept what has happened. We need to accept the fact that colonization has occurred and it is occurring from a neo-colonial standpoint. We need to not question it. We need to not fight against it. And we certainly don't need to organize against it. Doing any of those things would make us an enemy to the state. And they would make an example out of us by taking our lives, by putting us in jail, by any means necessary. But that doesn't mean that we need to give up the fight because we know what the risks are. It's because of those risks that we need to keep fighting because the alternative is for us to deny who we are. Next slide, please. So we can also think about how with self-esteem, comparing that, comparing that or coupling that, if you will, with capitalism and thinking most, most, most important, never, ever, ever forget the fact that capitalism is an anti-human system. You must never forget that family. If you leave today with remembering nothing else, please don't forget that. Capitalism is not a system that values humanity at all. It doesn't even value rich European folks. It doesn't even value rich European males. It doesn't value anyone because it's not a humane system. What it values is profit, which is not individual or human at all. What it values is continuing to make profit by any means necessary. So we have to understand that capitalism is not a system that wants to value the people that we are living with. It's not a system that wants to value people at all. That means, if we understand that, that capitalism will never ever have the base or the root or the intention to be able to advance humanity's culture, to be able to advance culture within the human race, to be able to advance how we as humans start to develop our culture, how we define culture. Capitalism will never be able to speak to that. Never, ever, ever, because that defeats the purpose of why it exists. If we can start to develop our own cultures, then maybe, just maybe, we might start to question the treatments that we're receiving, and then we might start to question other inequities, and that might lead to us organizing ourselves. And that's simply not okay. So we must be able to break that down and understand that we are all exploitive commodities within the system. We are all a means to an end. We are all users or pawns, if you will, and we are being used, I'm saying, well, some of us are users, but most of us are being used because we are just pawns on the chessboard where we can be in a position to advance the capitalist system, even at the cost of our family's sake and well-being, at the cost of our own health, at the cost of our mental sanity, at the cost of us having a roof over our head, at the cost of us dealing with oppression, whatever that looks like. And so we have to understand that there can't really be a healthy identity within capitalism. And the reason for that is because you don't matter. So how could your identity matter? Your identity is only important as it represents capitalism profiting off of you. This is why it's so important for us to understand you know, what February represents in terms of thinking about how we need to be pushing for African history and African herstory and African theirstory, where we focus on Africans everywhere, not just in the US, but Africans everywhere who have made a difference and understanding that there is more to Africans in the US in terms of our 
struggle, decentering American timelines and understanding that Africans in the Congo, Africans in Libya, Africans in Azania, Africans in uh, Guinea-Bissau, Africans in Cuba, Africans in different parts of South America, as well as the Dominican Republic, they have all done their part to make sure that we have an understanding of what it means to resist, what it means to be free, and what it means to ascertain our freedom and be more consistent with that. And so, you know, living under capitalism, you're not going to be able to access that. And this is why I was bringing this point up to talk about African history, because in February, that's why capitalism thrives and is the way it is. In February, when you go to Target, that's when you see the African history t-shirts, right? You may see them outside of February, but you're definitely going to see them mid-January to mid-March, because the intention is to profit off of you and to gain as much money from you, just like in Hulu, they'll highlight that so that you can see pieces that were written, directed, or starring African actors and actresses, right? Or people who act, right? So you can see that. Right now, we're seeing it from the Indigenous Hispanic Month, Heritage Month, right? We're seeing that. And we just finished um, Asian, Asian Pacific Islander Month, where we got to highlight Asian descent actors and actresses and people who are Asian descent who act, right? And all these different things. And so this is clearly propaganda. And we cannot be confused about that, you all. We cannot be confused by that. We have to understand that that is propaganda for capitalism to make the argument that it is down for the people, that it is down for our differences, that it is down for our stories and what makes us unique. But that couldn't be farther from the truth. The only reason that just seems to be the case is because it's all about profit. If you happen to be scrolling on Hulu and you see that it is, Indigenous Hispanic Heritage Month, you might call up your family and say, did you know that Hulu was recognizing this? And for family members that don't have a Hulu account, now they might be more inclined to invest in one. For families that don't shop at Target, but they've been interested in wearing some information that is conscious and that speaks to who they are as a people, now you can call up your sister and say, girl, they got t-shirts here that has Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz on it. And now your sister is more likely to go to Target and purchase a t-shirt. That's how it happens. That's exactly how it happens. And we have to understand. So because of all of that, home is clearly a manif manifestation of culture, history, her story, their story. Home is a manifestation of conquering classes, you all, where we have class division, where we have people under capitalism who think that they are better than us because they make more money than us. We also have people under capitalism who feel like their self-esteem needs to be lower because they know that socially, they are not gonna be treated as important as the same people who make more money than us. That's why class division is such an ugly thing because it doesn't take into account how all of us have something to contribute, unlike socialism, where those things are considered, Capitalism doesn't take into account how all of us have something to contribute. So this is why you have educators, you have people who are working with our children every day who don't have the paid off time that they deserve. They don't have equitable maternity leave. They don't have equitable paternity leave or parental leave. They don't have the things that they deserve. They certainly don't make the amount of money that they need to make. They have to come out of pocket for their freaking materials in the classroom for crying out loud. And now it's to the point where if you're a parent, you have to pay for that stuff yourself. And in some cases, they don't even ask you to just buy stuff for your kid. They're asking you to buy stuff for the rest of the class because we know that there are some students that can't afford those school supplies, right? And so like, these are the kind of things that we think about where we have doctors who are literally not listening to their patients and rushing them out the door but they want to make sure they make that profit though. So they're going to get billed for that visit. You're going to get billed for it, even if you didn't get your questions answered. And they're going to make sure that they're paid because doctors are more seen as important. They're more valued. They're more respected in this society. But why not educators though? Why not sanitation workers, right? But that's the world we live in, you all. 
that's the system we live in where it assigns value to some group of people in their professions and it devalues other groups of people in their profession, right? It literally makes you feel like you need to assess which of the two is more important. And that couldn't be farther from sick. That's a sick way to look at things, but that's where we are. So we have to understand that home being a manifestation means that these conquering classes, the class divide I was speaking about, they have an opportunity to continue to make us feel like we are insignificant, like we don't matter. That's where the self-esteem comes into play, where you don't know enough about your ancestors and who you are. So you start to question it on top of the fact where you feel like you don't really have a place to call home because you're so busy just trying to um, adjust and to manifest yourself where you can just deal with the real in terms of like actually tapping into the African in you or the Asian in you, or the indigenous in you, whatever meets your criteria of who you are. And so by understanding that, we understand that these conquering classes, they can't really claim conquered land as home and the confused workers are not gonna be able to do that. Because with the conquering classes, it's not going to allow us to really take on the lands that have also been conquered, right? It's not gonna allow us to take on the lands that have been colonized. We're not gonna be able to really tap into that because that would mean that we actually do have a connection to our identity, our healthy identity. And we just said that under capitalism, there is no such thing. You are not supposed to know who you are and you're certainly not supposed to tap into that and be proud of who you are. That is not what's supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen is you're supposed to fall in line because if you don't, you're considered unpatriotic. And if you don't fall in line, then people will accuse you of being unpatriotic when in actuality, you actually might learn a little bit more about yourself instead of trying to fall in line with something that you're simply not. Something that you're simply not. But being able to feel confident in that, being able to understand that it's okay to push against that, finding the confidence, that's where the self-esteem is gonna thrive. Finding the confidence to purchase one of our t-shirts from the Etsy store that says African period. Finding the confidence to do that. That's a conversation when you wear something like that. It's a conversation started when you wear something like that. Finding a way to wear things outside of February that promote African background and African history or their story or her story. Finding a way to feel so proud of who you are, where you come from, and knowing that you will always, always promote and protect the African in you, or the Asian in you, or the indigenous in you. If you are able to protect those things, then you can truly start to tap into where your home truly is because you understand that you carry it with you everywhere you go. And you're not gonna feel ashamed the next time somebody says something ignorant to you about it because you understand that you have a responsibility to the people and you have a responsibility to yourself. Ashe. Ashe, obrigada, midasi, asanti sana. And, you know, like you said, Shakur, I just want to reiterate, because I don't know if the recording picked it up in the beginning, that we are most definitely uh, dedicating this program to our comrades, Cicely Rogers, who made their physical transition. And like Kwame Ture said, the best way to honor anyone is to continue their work. So we want to step up our intensity around the question of anti-patriarchal work because we know our comrade Cicely would definitely want us to do that. So rest in power, comrade, and we will continue to do our absolute best to do this work. And on this topic of when they tell you to go back, you know, we want to just make it plain as humanly possible because, you know, here in the capitalist United Snakes of America, we are so conditioned to believe that everything is about here. And we don't really know anything that's happening anywhere else besides in this backward cesspool country. And, and a lot of us don't want to know anything outside of this backward cesspool country. But this question of when we go back is not just a U.S. phenomenon. Let's make that clear. Um, there are Africans, there are Asians, there are indigenous people all over the world. And the this is a problem where 
these colonized communities are being told, go back where you came from, not just in the United Snakes of America, but in Canada, in Europe, and in the Zionist state of Israel, in all of these colonized places, all of these settler colonies and colonized places and places dominated by um, neo-colonialism where uh, European capitalist culture is dominant. This is what our people are being told. And, and it's important for us to understand that this concept of telling someone to go back, telling colonized people to go back where they came from, this is a classic case of racist gaslighting. And if you're not clear, when we use the term gaslighting, what we mean is a process where you're doing something wrong and you're pointing that out. Or I'm sorry, someone is doing something wrong and you are pointing out to them that they're doing something wrong. And instead of them having the character and morality to say, you know what? Uh, you're right, I need to change my behavior, or at least say, you know what, I'll consider what you're saying. Instead, they start attacking you. Well, you yelled at me when you called out what I was doing wrong, and you yelled at me and you upset me because you yelled at me, and now I'm upset and I can't even function. That's that's an example of gaslighting. And that's what these scum of the earth are doing when they tell us to go back. This has always been a phenomenon in these colonized societies on earth. It's always been, it's not a new thing. It's certainly not a new thing. It's always been the case. But I think the difference now is we have the proliferation of social media, for example. So now you have all these cowards who would never tell any of us anything like this to our face. Never would they do that. But behind the safety of their keyboard, they feel completely comfortable saying these types of things to us. So it's it's become normalized from that sort of standpoint for them to talk to us like that. So that's the first thing that needs to be clearly understood. After that, this whole concept of Europeans or European thinking people, because there's a lot, there's plenty of crackers out here and there's plenty of graham crackers out here. So there are plenty of our people who perform the agenda of the capitalist uh, white supremacist patriarchy. They are willing soldiers to carry out that agenda. So we always have to never forget that. But it's important to contextualize these people telling us to go back and what's really beneath that. Because a lot of times someone will tell you that and you don't know what to say to them. And, and we don't understand how in the hell you don't know what to say to them because the truth is all around us, right? Like if we're in the United Snakes, for example, or we're in Canada or we're in Europe, how the hell did we get there in the first place? That's how you got to think about these questions. How do we get here? How do we get to the Western Hemisphere? How are we even here, right? And that's why it's important to know your history because if you're African, but you're like, I ain't no African, I'm, I'm something else, then well, of course you're going to be confused and you won't know how to answer when someone says that to you because you're just as dumb as they are. But if you understand your history, then you know that as an African, and I'll just trace my own individual um, family history. My parents, mother and father, came from Louisiana, from Shreveport and Monroe, Louisiana, here in the United States of America. Those territories, if you know the history, were colonized by the French, right, when this country was divided between British colonization, French colonization, Spanish colonization, different areas of the country, right? Well, that region was colonized by the French. And so that's why my family slave name, the name that the master gave us on the plantation was De Hort, a French name. And so that's our history. So our people, you know, I, I haven't done a DNA test because I don't really feel like I need to. I, I know who I am already. You know, I mean, I'm not throwing shade at you if you do that. That's an individual choice, but I don't Feel the need to do that. I don't, you know, it's not important to me. Maybe I'll, I'll do it one day. My wife wants me to do it. She's bought the test for me and keeps asking me to do it. And I'm sure I will, but it just is not, uh, it hasn't been a huge priority for me because I know exactly who I am. I am the descendant of African people who were kidnapped from the continent of Africa, taken through the Middle Passage, dropped off in the area known today as Louisiana, and struggled for our freedom. 
period. That's it. So since I know that, I know I'm an African fighting against capitalism. That's my identity. I'm, I have zero confusion about that. Zero uh, back and forth about that. Zero difficulty understanding any of that. I know exactly who I am. So it's important that we know this history. Colonization and slavery are the two reasons why we're in these European capitalist countries. Any and all Africans in the Western hemisphere, maybe there's five or six of us that this doesn't apply to, but for all you Negroes out there who are trying to act like, you know, thousands of you have been here, millions of you have been here the whole time and there was you had no participation in slavery, we know you're lying and you know you're lying. The overwhelming majority of us, 99.9% .9 of us today, and the, and the DNA tests that you're paying these European capitalist companies to get are confirming this, are here in the Western Hemisphere, you are because of the transatlantic slave trade. There's absolutely no question about that. And that slave trade stole us from Africa and brought us over here. The Africans that are in uh, Canada are there primarily because of Africans who were stolen and brought here in slavery and escaped slavery and did so by fleeing up to Canada, which did not have slavery. So that's why they're there. So if you talk to a lot of these Africans, right, particularly in these provinces, you know, um, that, uh, you know, don't know their lineage, what, what place in Africa they come from, like Nova Scotia, for example, a lot of the Africans there are there because Africans left the east coast of the United Snakes of America and went up there and settled. So if you talk to a lot of Africans in that region of Canada, um, in that province area of Canada, they will tell you that, well, my, my parents came from Virginia, that sort of thing. So that's the, the transatlantic slavery is still the reason why they're there. If you go to Africans in Europe, the reason why they're there is because Europe colonized Africa stole all of the resources from Africa, built its wealth in Europe based on robbing African human and material resources. And this created a rally, uh, reality rather, where Africa, although it produces all of these resources, did not have the basic capacity to build the infrastructure to develop a society. So if people wanted to go to college, and learn a science skill, learn a hard science, or do any of these types of educational endeavors, that is not available in Africa because the European colonial system set it up so that Africa would be forever reliant on Europe. And so this is the reason why Africans have had to leave Senegal and go to France, leave Mali and Burkina Faso and go to France, leave Cameroon and go to France, leave Nigeria and Ghana and Kenya and go to Britain, leave uh, Guinea-Bissau, Angola, and Mozambique, and go to Portugal. These are the reasons for that. Leave Equatorial Guinea and go to Spain. This is why Africans are in these countries. And if you don't know that history, and one of these backward-ass uh, backward hillbillies comes up to you and tells you, well, go back to Africa, then if you don't know this history, then you'll feel like, well, they're telling me to go back and I want to claim my America, my right to be in America. I'm an American and some backward ass uh, nonsense like that. And, and you'll find yourself by default validating them by feeling like you have to respond to them, respond to that filth, respond to that trash. And that's the trap that they get us in. And that applies not only to African people, but indigenous people. They tell you to go back and you feel like you have to validate yourself to be in their society when all you should really be telling them is get the hell out of my land. You're in my land. Goddamn uh, cracker. That's what I tell them all the time. Get in your kayak and kayak back. Get in your raft and kayak back to Europe. You have no rights here. This is not your land. This is stolen property. You stole it. That's how you got to talk to these people. But if you don't know the history, you won't be able to do that. You'll be trying to defend yourself and justify why, why they're here. And, and this is why the quote by Mangaliso Sabukwe, Robert Sabukwe, the great founder of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, was so correct when he said that Europe belonged to the Europeans, Asia belonged to the Asians, but Africa belongs to whoever invaded it. That's insane. Africa belongs to the Africans. 
And that's why we, if we know our identity, we know that. So these things are not a problem for me because I know I'm an African in America fighting against capitalism. So there's nothing these people can say to me that is going to derail me and throw me off track. I don't have to answer them. I don't need them. I don't give a damn what they think or feel about me. Not at all. And the fact that I feel that way genuinely, I'm not just saying it, then that's more than likely the reason why they never talk to me like that because they know that they'll they'll be they'll get a response that they're not prepared to handle right so we got to talk about dignity because Shakur touched on it and i think that's a big part of this problem as well as social media today dignity and our lack of it is a big part of this problem and the reason why i have the picture of uh, little bobby hutton and Bobby Seale and the Black Panther Party members going into the California State Capitol on May 2nd, 1967 with the guns and reading a statement about the police terror being waged against African people all over the world is that was an act of dignity. And if you're looking at a, a screen and you see this, and hopefully you are, you can look in their faces. Bobby Hutton was a young 17 years old when he took this picture and he only had, it was only three more months before the Oakland police uh, brutally and savagely killed him in Oakland. But this was a 17 year old African and you could see the dignity and pride on his face. And you look around at us today and we don't have that look. We don't have that. And this is what we need to get back you all. And that means, you know, it's time to stop being such a damn coward, right? Like, all you see now is these racist crackers and graham crackers and foot scum and all these low-life uh, pieces of garbage are telling us go back and calling us the N-word. And the only thing a lot of you know how to do is take out your phone and start filming them while they're insulting you. And you're like, I'm going to call the police. Why are you talking to me like that? Well, th that if I was them, I would talk to you more like that if that was your response. If that was all you're prepared to do, I, I'm not that. I, I belong here. I was born here. Well, you know, you you're playing right into it. Basically, what you're doing is saying you're higher than me, and I have to validate and justify my existence as a human being to you, even though you're nothing but bottom shoe scum. And that's cowardice. You may not mean it to be cowardice, but that's exactly what it is. So this is a great time for us to learn how to stand up for ourselves and stand up for justice and stop reaffirming their racist behavior by validating it. Stop explaining to them who the hell you are and whether you have a right to be somewhere. They handle with these goddamn people. Tell them to go to hell and prepare yourself, right? Get prepared so that when these people confront you, you can tell them to go to hell. And if they're ready right now and got their bags packed, you'll send them there, goddammit. And if we start acting like that, they'll start treating us, stop treating us that way. You know, bullies know how to engage people that they know they can dominate. And that's what they do. That's what I'm telling you. Nobody talks to me like a, they attempt to. You know, I, I mean, I did some the clown that last week was like, well, I don't understand. Like, I, he asked me, I had a, a, a shirt with Che Guevara on it. And he's like, well, why do you have that shirt on? I'm like, well, what are you, you want to be my biographer or something? What, what, why are you at, what, what, what's it to you? And he said, well, I'm just wondering why you have that shirt on. I'm like, well, why does someone normally wear something uh, individual on their clothes? Well, because they're trying to say that they support this person. I'm like, okay, so obviously, you know, you're smarter than you look. I said that to him because I'm not going to play these damn games with these people. I said, so what's your point? You got something you want to say? And he's like, well, I just think that um, if you have that shirt on, you don't know much. And then I just cut him off. I'm like, I'm not going to stand here and pretend that you know anything about Che Guevara. I'm not going to do that. You don't know damn, you know damn well you haven't read one sentence about what Che The best you got is what somebody dumber than you told you about it. I said, I'm sorry. I'm not going to stand here and waste my time with that. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. I'm proud to wear this shirt. I said, and if you know anything about him, then you know that if I have his shirt on, I share his values 100%. So he, the cracker knew what I meant because he walked off. He understood that that meant like, if you keep messing with me, there'll be consequences. So, you know, this is why 
some of us don't have to deal with this. And it's also why many of you do, because you give off this energy like, oh, I'm just, if, if master, if you just let me occupy this little space, I won't hurt nothing. I'm just a little slave trying to exist, just trying to get a little money. And I, I ain't going to cause no problem, sir. I ain't going to cause you no problem, ma'am. I'm just going to try to be the best little Negro I can be for you. Stop affirming their racist behavior by validating it. And stop feeling like you have to help them see the light. I mean, that's so disgusting. So many of us feel like when these crackers are racist to us that we have to help them understand. So look, these people know exactly what the hell they're doing, okay? And if, if you are in such a sick and distorted state that they can disrespect you and you feel like you have to explain to them why it's wrong for them to disrespect you, the problem there is you, as far as, as I see it. It's not them. Because I know who they are. A dog, a, whoop, a dog's going to be a dog all the time. I got a dog in here, a, a pit bull dog. When I go in there, she's going to do pit bull things. She's going to tear the hell up out of everything and do what she does every day. That's who she is. I, I don't expect anything worse. That's why we, we work with her to train her, and that's the process that you have when you have. You can't sit down with her. I can't sit down with her and say, Zuri, I want you to stop tearing up all the things in this house and for her to sit there and say, well, you know what, Ajamu, you're right. I'm As of here forward, I'm not going to do that anymore. She's a dog. That's what she's going to do. She's a puppy. That's what she's going to do. So you got to understand these ratchet ass people are going to do what they do. You can't feel like it's your responsibility. To, I mean, what a sick and dysfunctional Stockholm syndrome type thing is that? That you, these people disrespecting you and you're going to sit there and explain to them why it's wrong for them to disrespect you. And then you don't understand why, that, how, how does, when does that ever work? Where they said, oh, well, you know what? Now that you've explained, I'm sorry. I'm never going to do this again. No, they get worse with their behavior because they don't have any morality. And you have to expect that just because you have some doesn't mean they have any. You got to understand that there are people out here who have sacrificed their morality in order for them to give allegiance to a backward cesspool system. There's no way they can have morality and back the capitalist system. It's not possible. It's an oxymoron. It cannot exist. So what we've got to do is start getting organized and give them the exact same energy that they give us. And we don't want to hear nothing about, well, two wrongs don't make a right. I, I'm going to tell you, my whole life, giving them the same energy has helped me tremendously. And I'll explain to you how it has helped me. Number one, it has released all that stress off of my shoulders. And I'm sitting here to you with you right now in my 60s in outstanding mental and physical shape. And the reason for that is I don't bear all the energy of this backward ass system. So giving them that energy releases you. This is what Franz Fanon talked about in his books, Black Skin, White Mask, and the Wretched of the Earth. He was a psychiatrist born in Martinique in the Caribbean who went on to become a leading figure in the Algerian and the Pan-African Revolution in Africa. And what Fanon talked about is that when somebody is brutalizing us as African people, the best way for us to reclaim our dignity is to stand up and fight them back, not beg them, not sing to them, but when they're swinging at us, duck their blow and beat the hell out of them. That's what Fanon was talking about. And we subscribe to that 100%. And I'm telling you, you should try it sometime because if you do it, it'll help you eliminate all these other problems. You got all these psychological problems you can't, function in society, it'll help you a whole lot because what it'll do is establish for you in your own psyche that you got every goddamn right as anyone else to be here. And that's a big part of your problem is that part of you doesn't believe that you have a right to be here. And you better believe you're as important as anybody else. You got every right to be here, but you got to act like that. And you got to, you, you train people how to treat you. You got to train these people how to respect you. That's what we're talking about here. If you don't train people how to respect you, they never will. And the problem we have as colonized people, not just African people, but all colonized people, is that we are trying to fit in with a system that has told us in no uncertain terms that it has no desire to have us fit in in Europe, 
in the Americas. It has no desire to accept this. And we still ignore that. And we're still trying to prove to these people that we can fit into their system. To hell with that. I'm not trying to prove nothing to these people. I'm trying to fight to get these lands back to the people that these people, those people stole them from. And if they don't like it, they, they just, all they can do is get the hell out of my way. They can't stop it. And that's why I get nothing but respect from them. For that very reason. Oh, what does that shirt mean? What does that flag mean? Oh, go oh, yeah, shirt the other day. They had the 4th of July crossed out. I was wearing and the, the guy, can you, I, I'm, I don't, I don't want to be rude, but can I ask you a question? I'm like, you just did. Oh, oh, okay. Um, well, what does that mean? I'm like, well, it says July 4th and it's crossed out. So wh what do you think they're saying? It's saying you don't celebrate the 4th of July. I'm like, if I had, if I had a cookie, I'd give it to you. That's, I mean, that's amazing that you could figure that out. And I just kept walking and he had to accept that on my terms, damn it. I'm not going to be sitting here talking to these people the way they want to talk, letting them say, y'all sit there with your cameras rolling and let these people insult you for five, 10 minutes. And don't say a word because you're so afraid of them. So afraid. You're so afraid they're going to hurt you. They already are hurting you. Why not us get organized and deal with them collectively and stop the hurt once and for all? That's all we're saying. I mean, if you think that's crazy, pick up the mirror. The craziness is staring right back at you. So the necessary formula here is we've just been taught to deny our humanity in favor of our enemy's interests. That's why we try to, you know, we think that if everything that the capitalist system values, we value it. It must be important if they're recognizing it. Like this program here is not on the capitalist stations. If it was, you would look at it a whole lot different. I'm just telling you the truth because you have been conditioned to believe that what they recognize has more value. And that's the perfect strategy for enemy to dehumanize uh, the force that they're colonizing is to get them to believe that everything the enemy recognizes has more value. And that's what they've done to us. We have been taught to think that way, that what they value, that's why you all are so into celebrity culture because they raise up these Negro sellout celebrities. And so you can't wait to hear what these people have to say when they're not saying a goddamn thing worth listening to. So that's the first thing we have to recognize is we have been taught to do this. We've been taught to deny our humanity in favor of our enemy's interests. We have been taught to deny our humanity in favor of our enemy's interests. And you can't deny that. Any of you Africans that are in the US military can't deny that. The fact that you're in the military fighting their wars for them and having nothing from what you're doing benefit the masses of African people anywhere on earth. And you can't even, other than maybe a, a damn job that you got or a mortgage loan or some worthless, valueless bullshit like that. Other than that, you can't name one thing that has happened from your existence in the enemy's military that's advanced our people. So there's no question that we have been taught to deny our humanity in favor of our enemy's interests. And we also believe that our enemy values anything, that, or rather we believe that whatever our enemies value is validating that, as being superior to what we value. And we practice that every single day. You know, and I just gave an example that also applies to that. And we have to break free from this slave thinking. Like, you know, there's this narrative out here right now that says that, well, you know, people, you know, it's, we're past this, this stage where we need to fight the enemy, fight the capitalist system. We have to build this separate economic program for African people. And that's really how we should be fighting. We can't be talking about building, having organizing for no revolution. There, there's a widespread agenda out here saying that. And, you know, if, 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 if this was a world based on individuality and individualism, where everything that we all got, we got on our own, then I wouldn't really have an argument against that thinking. But that is not the world that we live in. The reality is that each and every one of us is in debt to humanity because there's not a baby that's ever been born that could live, function, and grow by themselves. Babies have to have other people to take care of them to grow and function. They have to have other people to socialize them, to function within the world on a level that will allow them to interact effectively with other human beings. 
All of us owe a debt to society because of this. And in the case of colonized people, speaking specifically about African people here, our people wage a relentless struggle against our enemies for our collective forward progress. So for that reason, that's the reason why I can never accept this logic that, well, I can't be a part of any struggle because I don't believe in that. Because no matter what you say, the irrefutable reality is if our ancestors had adopted the selfish position that you adopt, you would be dead right now. The only reason why you're here and able to be such a selfish asshole is because our people that came before you sacrificed their own individual interests to serve the masses of our people. That's I think we could go through the line of all of our all of us telling our family stories and we would see that easily. My own family, but my own father, my mother escaped Louisiana to get out here. To California. My father had a full ride scholarship to Morehouse University and didn't take it because of problems the family had in rural Louisiana. He came out here and, and never went to college, didn't do any college, and sacrificed his whole life so that I could go. And as soon as he retired from his job at the post office, was dead within six months, but dedicated his whole life to advancing and making it so that I could do this. So there's no way in hell you're gonna tell me that I'm, I'm, I did this by myself and I'm responsible for what I do. No, I have a debt that I have to pay back. I can't pay it back to him, he's gone, but I can pay it back to the future generations. I can't pay it back to my mother, she's gone, but I can pay it back to the future generations. So we can never accept this individualistic reality that the way you want to define your existence is the way it is. No, you, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you want to admit it or not, you have a responsibility to the masses of our people and the masses of humanity. And if you don't do anything to accept that responsibility, then you are, as Franz Fanon said, fulfilling his statement when he said, each generation has a mission and you will either fulfill it or betray it. And if you decide to do that, you're just deciding to betray your, your mission. And at this stage, our movement is weak. So you think nothing will happen. You can do whatever you want. But at some stage, we will not be weak. And people like that will be dealt with in the fashion that they should be dealt with. So hell yeah, I wear a Che Guevara shirt because I believe that people should be dealt with who need to be dealt with. They've been dealing with us for 500 years. You ain't got nothing to say about that. So we're going to continue to live on dignity. We invite you to join us. And we thank you for joining us today. We invite you back next week. You know, September 22nd is International Day Against, they call it police brutality, but we call it police terrorism because that's what it is. So join us next week when we talk about International Day Against Police Terrorism, what that looks like and why we should be interested and involved in that. The upper left-hand QR code takes you to all of our various APRP programs, as well as the Forward Ever Shop that Shakur mentioned, where you can buy revolutionary Pan-African uh, apparel and support the African revolution. And it'll take you also to the link for hoodcommunist.org, a revolutionary blog that is a wonderful blog with wonderful uh, insights into the worldwide African existence. And we invite you to join the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Go to aprp-intl.org and donate to the AAPRP at Venmo at A-AAPRP or PayPal at AAPRP, no dash. And then we invite you to become a monthly sponsor of Burkina Books in Burkina Faso, one of our on-the-ground projects for the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And we invite you to buy my book or tell people about it so they can buy it, a guide for organizing defense against white supremacist, patriarchal, and fascist violence. These elections are happening in Europe, in Canada, in Zionist Israel, in the United States of America, in the Caribbean, Central South America, all over Africa. Our people are not safe. And one of the things that we do is train people how to defend themselves. We finance their work from the meager proceeds that come from buying this little eight dollar book off of amazon so please do it and tell others to do it so that we can get our people or the
recognized and ready to fight back and standing on our dignity. Rest strong, Sister Cicely Rogers. We love you. We appreciate your contributions that you made. And we will continue the work that we knew you wanted us to do. We will continue to work. We will smash capitalism. We will smash white supremacy. We will smash patriarchy and homophobia. And you did your part. You rest well. The rest is up to us. Forward ever. <laughs>